Greetings, everybody who's law, who are logging on at the moment from all around the world. I can already see quite a few of you from various locations around the globe. Welcome to you. Uh, welcome to our next uh, panel discussion as part of the Trees and Seas Festival. This is the final, the final panel discussion. We've had six all week during our amazing festival that's been going on since August, sec, uh, August 2nd. You're here with Creativity as a Voice for the Planet, How Art and Artists Can Inspire Change and Action. Uh, within such things as socio-environmental uh, movements and causes. Uh, trees and seeds, we're going on in 30 locations around the world. We're planting nearly 100,000 trees during this week. We've had over 100 beach cleanups with many more still to come this weekend. Workshops, film screenings, music performances. Uh, it's been quite experience for our team, two years in the making and this uh, series of panel discussions um, have certainly been a very interesting process to go through and just wonderful information all week long. Um, they have been absolutely free. They've been brought to us by Montes Wines, our, our very generous uh, presenting partner in Trees and Seas. So we certainly want to thank them for their particip uh, participation and as well as for all of you uh, coming and joining and our panelists as well, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, one thing to notice, we are giving away a choice. Uh, we have five random winners today during um, the panel discussion. So you're going to have a choice of either our brand new book, Living Without Plastic, which we published earlier this year with Artisan Books, or from one of our uh, panelists uh, who you'll meet in just a moment, Marissa Quinn, we also have a, a limited edition print um, of, a, of the official artwork for the Trees and Seas Festival. So uh, those names will be listed at the end of the panel. So when we're done, just, just kind of hold tight and we're gonna show those five winners up on the screen right at the end of, of the panel. Uh, we wanna remind participants that you can certainly engage within the conversation. There's a Q and A box if you're joining through Zoom towards the bottom of your screen or certainly into the panel, um, in, into the chat box on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Okay, with that, we want to introduce you to today's panelists. Let me bring up some information here. First of all, joining us um, is Matthew Modine, is an actor, uh, is an actor, activist, and filmmaker who's been a mainstay of film, television, and stage for over 30 years. You guys have seen him in various films like Full Metal Jacket, The Dark Knight Rises, Married to the Mob, Vision Quest, and of course a younger generation knows him as a very interesting and, and intriguing Dr. Martin Brenner on Netflix, Stranger Things. Uh, Marissa Quinn, who I mentioned a, min a moment ago, is the official artist of our Trees and Seas Festival. Uh, she is renowned for her highly detailed pen and ink drawings based on personal visions and dream states. Her work narrates the cyclical stories of extinction and growth in nature. And once again, she is also the one who created our official artwork that you will have a chance to win at the end. Uh, Mahani Tayavi is a very special person who I've known for a couple of years now. She's a pioneering artist who bridges the creative world with education and environmental activism. She is a world-renowned classical pan uh, pianist and, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the co-founder of Toki Music School on Rapa Nui, or also known as Easter Island. Um, and her recent album, Rapa Nui Odyssey, has received rave reviews, and many of you have probably seen her recent on any number of the most major broadcast shows um, in the world, performing and, and talking. And finally, our moderator is Asher J. Her compelling paintings, sculptures, installations, animations, ad campaigns, and films all have a single pur purpose, which is to incite global action on behalf of wildlife conservation. She is the founder and CEO of Hive and Hamlet and is recognized as a National Geographic Explorer. With that, Asher, I happily turn over the conversation to you and I look forward to hearing every, everything that's talked about. Hi, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I would like to bring on Matthew Modine, Marissa Quinn and Mahani Tiabe onto our virtual stage. Hi, Matthew, pleasure to have you Hi, here. Hi, Asher, thank you so Hi, much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And uh, Mahani is- Hello, Asher. Hello, everybody. Hello, it's wonderful to be here sharing with all of you. Perfect. And Marissa, real pleasure to have your extraordinary talents and creative abilities just managed to see all of your artwork. They're so fluid and poetic to experience. Welcome Thank here. You. Thank you. We're just gonna get started, um, get deep into the dialogue from the get-go. Um, I wanna pose a question to each of you, which is, how did you decide to show up for something outside of the self? Because most are trapped within their own realities and they're very insular in their approach of what is needed from them on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So those of us who do have the privilege to care, and do you think it's a privilege as well to care? And how did you manage to step up and exercise that 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 uh, calling that you experienced to care for something outside of you? Do you, do you have someone who you want to go first? I'm gonna uh, yeah, Matthew, go ahead. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, uh, well, my, my journey began uh, in the ocean. I, I was a surfer and uh, loved the ocean. And I, I, I fell in love with Jacques Cousteau, you know, who was a great ocean explorer and taught me so much about the ocean that I didn't know uh, so much about. And that led me to studying oceanography in college. And, and one day I, I came to class and my professor was crying and I said, what's wrong? And he said that, forget it. He said, it, it, I said, what do you mean, forget it? What, what, it was so, so scary for a young 18 year old boy to see his professor crying and saying, forget it. And he told me that at any moment, the earth's oceans are going to die. And I said, what, what do you mean? And uh, he was talking about the, the human and industrial runoff, uh, chemical runoff from, from agriculture um that that everything that ends up in the streams and the rivers ends up in the oceans and um he he wasn't yet talking about the acidification of the ocean or or the warming of the ocean um the the problems that we face with the ocean now with plastic in the ocean and it was it was so frightening to me i, I dropped out of college i moved to new york city and and studied acting um, but I never lost my passion for the ocean and, and never forgot his words about how the ocean was sick. And um, so I've, I've continued my environmentalism and my activism over the course of my career, the last 40 years, doing different things that I can. I started and I was filming in Morocco and I instituted a, a plastic bottle uh, uh, reclamation project uh, it, because when i was a boy i used to collect bottles along the side of the road to bring that bottle to the place and get a nickel back so i could buy a candy bar so i i i, I was in warzazat morocco and i told the mayor about that and it was a, a simple way a very practical way of cleaning up the desert and providing some pocket change for young children um i in the in the my my industry the the scripts used to be printed uh, they used to be printed single sided. So a script would be 120 pages. And so this is what this is. It's a double sided script. that's like a book. And I int introduced that idea to the industry and it's literally saved billions of sheets of paper, um, uh, which is now changed because mostly people read scripts online. But uh, it, so I, I've, as I say, I've continued the environmentalism. And I think the most important thing that I've discovered when I speak to young children in schools about, about environmentalism, it's a simple sentence. I ask them when you, when, you have, when you have something that you don't want or that you're finished with what you do with it. And they said, you throw it away. And I said, okay, where is a way? And you see their little minds trying to figure out what that means. And, and it, it plants a seed of the idea that nothing goes away, that we live on this isolated planet in this gigantic, vast universe and multiverse, and that there's no place like this precious little place we call home. And it, I think it instills in those young people's minds the, the importance of protecting the world that we have and doing everything within our powers to reduce the amount of consumption that we, we uh, are imposing upon the planet, that we are consuming the Earth's resources at an unsustainable pace and producing uh, more garbage than we know what to do with. Um, so uh, that's me, that's Matthew Modine, and it was a pleasure uh, to, to meet wh whomever is on the other side of this computer screen. Marissa, how about you? First of all, thanks for having me. And I do apologize if you hear the frogs and the roosters, it's morning here, so. <laughs> um, but um, with my story, I actually, similar to Matthew, got started um, with understanding environmental issues through the ocean, actually. Um, I'm a surfer and I'm from Southern California. Um, and I'm from a small town, very close to the border of Mexico. 
Um, and the town actually has seen climate change firsthand. And something that's really unique about surfers is we have kind of this amateur um, fascination with nature and how everything works from the tides and the swells and um, yeah, just different ways that the ocean kind of um, comes together in this one moment of a wave. And so we get obsessive about it and we go to the same cliff every morning, overlooking the same wave every day. And after seeing that wave over and over and over again for decades, you really get to know the coastline. And I saw firsthand um, sea level rising, erosion, pollution, um, gosh, just heartbreaking stuff that um, is just right there in my hometown. And so through that kind of amateur um, study of, you know, biology and marine biology, um, I started blending my artwork with that at the time of, you know, my peak obsession with surfing, I was in grad school. And um, it was really interesting to begin to blend my artwork, which is all about environmentalism and illustrating marine biology um, in a very scientific way, um, blending that with, you know, my background as a surfer. And um, yeah, it was really interesting to, at that time in grad school, I was studying art and how to communicate through the visual arts. And then in addition, how to add in a environmental issue. So a lot of my study had to do with Jungian theory and communication. Um, it got very nerdy, but um, through all of that, I learned how to blend together um, the arts with communication and scientific issues. So that first um, graduate thesis show that I had was picking out about 10 different environmental issues across the globe, um, creating really large um, 40 inch by 33 inch drawings that were very scientific, anatomically accurate, but also adding in a little bit of surrealism in there. And that kind of dream state um, narrative that you add to scientific facts really does resonate with the story within each person. And through that show, people began to be inspired to take um, initiative and um, kind of launch into their own personal conservation um, of the planet. So that was kind of where it all started. That was about 10 years ago. So, yeah. And you, Mah Mahani, um, I just heard- oh, Hello, you everybody. <laughs> Sorry? No, I just wanted to say, I heard you play this morning and in your musical school with made of all the plastic bottles. So I already know you have a huge connection to the oceans and uh, <laughs> I'm curious to learn as to how you inspired to show up for your environmental activism. Yes, well, I, I come from an, an American Rapa Nui family. My mother is American and my father is from Easter Island and I grew up on the island. And on my American side, they are very, very strong. Um, environmentalist my great grandfather great grandfather was one of the founders of sierra club and you know the, my grandfather fought to save many many things in the states and um somehow it was always um uh, talked at home it was always part of our daily conversation nature environment the taking care of um our planet our planet as one and only home that we have and also living here on the island, I think was very special because not only are you completely immersed in nature, in the raw nature, but also you know that whatever trash you throw, you know exactly where it goes. And I mean, I know the place and I've been to the place and since childhood, we know that this mountain of garbage is growing. And we know that our island is a limited space and this added to the fact that throughout the years, we started to see how more and more and more plastic is arriving to our, our coasts and consider that we are the most isolated inhabited place in the world and our beaches are completely full of microplastic. And if you start to think about that, it's, a, it's really shocking because you think how much garbage, how much are we contaminating that it's arriving? 
to our beach and it's now the sand in which our children are playing with mm -hmm. so these things throughout time were very uh, like i just sort of observe and and think about and really I, i'm very sensitive because i'm you know we artists are somehow uh, uh, really alert to to what's outside because it connects so profoundly to our inside and it has everything to do with what we express so throughout time i started feeling we are i mean we are such a brief moment in this planet that it cannot only be about our job about um, you know making more money to buy more things which anyway will be thrown out and and then we go, you know, we came with nothing, we leave with nothing. So what's the purpose of all of this? So I, I realized that while we have to, of course, uh, work and buy our food and pay our, you know, rent or whatever, we also need to uh, be conscious that all of, I mean, everything we do impacts other people, impacts our home, and that we actually have a mission in this life and it's to leave this place a little bit better than what we found and throughout the years um well i had a chance to to be concertizing i studied abroad in germany and united states and and through the music i felt that the music was very soothing for the souls of people uh, i think it's one of the best or probably uh, most important healing that we can do is through the music uh, but at the same time I was far away from my home and I was always thinking what can I do to help my people you know there's no music school we have all this garbage problem we have so many environmental issues happening on the island uh, because I mean how can I help that was my 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 only thought that just would not leave me and finally the opportunity came with other Rapa Nui young people who had gone to study uh, also outside of the island and each one with a very just uh, noble heart had left everything to go and learn and take tools from other places to be able to come back to the island and help thinking that we all want to help our planet but we have to start where where we are which is our home so we founded NGO Toki and we were able to start the first music school and when the time of construction came we thought okay we don't want to just build any kind of construction we want to do something that can help uh, inspire other people that can give solution to our problems uh, and that can help also as an example so we investigated and we arrived at a uh, michael reynolds model of earthship biotecture where he builds with uses uh, tires with compacted earth to build walls and uses bottles. We have thousands and thousands of bottles and cans in our walls and tires and tons of cardboard. And it's a completely independent off the grid uh, construction. So we had the, the biggest solar panel system at the time. And now lots of people have solar panels, which is amazing. And it also has water collector, rainwater collectors, and we used about six years of garbage in this in the building of the school. And the concept behind this also is that uh, we cannot do things alone. I mean, we can, but it won't have as much an impact. We have to join hands and do things in a collaborative way. So the way we built the school was inviting people from all over the world to come and help and it was it it was really amazing and it's still enabled to continue with um, the agricultural project which is uh, rescuing the ancestral species and also like a laboratory to see what is the most optimal way of um, cultivating in small spaces with less resources and less hands and so yeah, sorry. I think I, I went off already on the branches, but I <laughs> finish your thought. You never know. Really you. Um, but this is yeah. I'd say the islet. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting because all of us seem to have um, sort of ocean as the entry point and the gateway to caring about something bigger than ourselves. Because it does 
envelope 70 percent of the planet and it's the resource that's taken most for granted because because it is the tragedy of the commons it's available to all and therefore it's so hard to exercise true stakeholdership within it um especially beyond the eezs and we mark these areas off and say hey this is how much we will care as a country about our coastline and beyond that it's sort of free for all again you know and so there's a level of harvesting that occurs exploitation that occurs just because there's no one who exercises um sort of ownership of something that is at stake out there and it also seems boundless because it's very hard for very many people to wrap their head around the idea that the ocean is finite the planet is finite these resources are not available um at at all times endlessly and we can just keep taking and do business as usual and things are still going to be available to us um so there's a lot of realities confronting and compounding and i think the compounding aspect is truly um missed by very many and so people keep doing what they've been doing and and it's uh, created this weird feedback loop of denudation right and so to interrupt that loop you have to show up differently you can't solve for the problems that have been given rise to by a certain mindset with the same consciousness so you know, I, I feel like in the very short conversation I've had, like with Matthew, for instance, he mentioned meditation. You, I think each of you has your own way of showing up that allows you to be more mindful and inclusive of the world. So what is your practice? How do you get to a, a place of center? Um, and, and also the availability, like decluttering within so you can be available and hold space for something outside of you. Matthew, um, we'll kick start with you again. Uh, that's a very good question, Asher. Um, I mean, one of one of the privileges of my life has been that uh, I, I, I've had a successful career as an actor. Um, that's provided me with the opportunity to travel uh, on six of the seven continents um, to over twenty countries. And what you, I mean, I, I dare not sort of figure out what my carbon footprint is, but I have planted a lot of trees. Um, uh, but not enough. I think I have to do more. Um, but what what it's given me the privilege of of discovering is uh, the commonality of human human beings, uh, the urgency of of our responsibility to this planet that, uh, that that we have to move much more quickly than we are, and it's going to take a, a, a massive global uh push from all of the countries in the world just like this global pandemic i, I think that the the similarities between the virus and and uh climate change and and not just climate change but the, the, the how compromised our ocean is how compromised our water around the planet is, is becoming how precious fresh drinking water is to so many billions of people around the planet that the urgency is tremendous that um, you know, here we are in the United States where there's there's so much concern about um, migration from the southern border. Uh, what, what we are going to experience with climate change is probably the largest mass migration of human beings in the history of the planet. Um, so th the work that I've been able to do has not only given me the opportunity to travel around the world and see these things firsthand, it's also provided me with time to think. Um, that's something that that uh, many people and and on our planet don't have the opportunity to just to think because we all have to work so hard in order to uh, pay our rent and and put food on the table, take care of our families. So the the in addition to the privilege of travel and experience and and meeting other people, it's given me time to reflect and to look upon those problems and to see myself as an instrument of of, of change and in a in a and a person who can share that information that i have learned and and uh, it, i i think that's that's so important that when you're given so much it's a responsibility to give 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 back you know as much as you can that you that you've gained in this life um i have one question for marissa because she said she grew up down in san diego southern california near the border I, I grew up surfing in Imperial Beach. That's that's my local IB. What, what beach were you surfing on, Marissa? That's amazing. I have a lot of family in IB, um, <laughs> but I grew up in Encinitas. And yeah, oh, yeah. Encinitas. Yes, because the problem, you know, speaking of the problems environmental, I suffered. My my beach was closed probably 20, 30 days of the year after a big rain because of the Tijuana River. 
Um, now it's closed. I, I think Imperial Beach might be closed more than 100, 150 days a year because Tijuana has become such a gigantic city in Mexico, maybe the third or fourth largest city in Mexico. And the Tijuana River has still never been addressed. So uh, raw sewage, garbage, uh, chemical waste, God knows what ends up in the Tijuana River. And when it rains, it all goes into the beach. And, and that's only, it's less than a mile from the border. And that, that, uh, that horror that comes out of the Tijuana River uh, affects all the way up to Encinitas, it, it, La Jolla, that uh, 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 SeaWorld, who does a lot of animal rescue and important work to be able to save sea lions and whales, they get caught in fishing nets and, and garbage. The amount of cancer that they're seeing in, in sea lions uh, along the coast is uh, unprecedented. And those are uh, what we, you know, the canary in the coal mine, that what we're seeing with the, the, the animals that live in the sea, the cancers, the, the infections, the, the sores that don't heal, that's a, all a, a direct result of human behavior and, and what we are doing to the ocean. I'm sorry to have interrupted you, Marissa, but, but, I, but we're, we're San Diego locals. <laughs> Marissa, before you go on, I'm just going to add another layer to, to this, this question for you and uh, Mahani, because I think coming from the artistic perspective as well and looking at your work, um, how, do you, and all of you have touched on this in some way, which is the repeat patterns of behavior, repeat patterns in systems. And that's something I've always looked at when I've designed campaigns or created any content for the world to see is, you know, that our circulatory system is very similar to the ocean currents. If you're looking at our lungs and then looking at how brown branching occurs in the world, whether it's on coral reefs or on trees, there's so many repeat motifs and scalable patterns that keep occurring. Are we paying attention and how do you bring awareness to that and, and sort of mindful intention and being cognizant of those patterns? And therefore, maybe if you're conscious of the fact that you put aspirin in your blood and it's going to circulate all over your body in the same capacity, if you toss a bottle into the ocean, it's going to circulate and end up on Easter Island. How do you do that with your work? And same thing with Mahani as well with your compositions, because I think I think as artists, we see a motif and how does it repeat and sequence into harmonies, into compositions? So I think you two would have an additional layer to add to the mindfulness practice so we'd love to hear your thoughts on that yeah absolutely i think that was beautifully said um the idea of whatever happens in the microcosm is a reflection of the macrocosm and i mean that is why we do our own spiritual practices and why we do go inward and sort through things inside in order to have that aligned and then build outward, right? And so I think, especially with art and any form of art, whether it's music or visual art, acting, poetry, whatever it is, um, creative expression, I guess, would be a good blanket of that. Um, for me, I really do see it as kind of the universal language. It's like the collective consciousness, which is very Jungian from my studies back in the day. But um, that collective spirit is something that if we all, I truly believe as humanity are able to tap into together, then we can start to sort out a collective narrative and a collective ownership of huge issues, huge systems that, you know, need to be changed from the individual all the way up to the major corporations, the global powers that are. And um, I think to start inward and build outward, probably the next step from the inward to the outward is creative expression. And um, like your observations are, you know, super similar to mine where I can see something like a circulatory system in my own body is super similar to patterns that you see in nature from a leaf to water systems to different patterns that you can just continuously see. And um, I feel like that is that conversation of uh, unity of, um, observation and um, it kind of takes that ownership away and, um, as far as like domination and it turns it into more of a collective um, like oneness and um, inspiration to go you know after these issues um, and I guess on a personal level um, my practices are meditation yoga and obviously surfing 
And, um, beyond myself, I try to have, um, a communal aspect. So I do have several mentors who are older women, um, who have gone through what I've gone through and who can pass wisdom down to me. Um, a lot of my other practices have to do with nature immersion and, um, consumption of plants and having a really good diet, um, making sure that my own behavior does not leave a footprint um, as much as possible. Obviously we all do. Um, but, and then as well as having those mentors um, also making sure that I'm passing down my knowledge to generations below me. So I do teach, um, currently I'm a professor at Point Loma Nazarene University. Um, and I'm just on their adjunct staff, but I try to make sure that as I'm progressing in my career, I'm also being influenced by my elders and then passing down that knowledge to the younger generation as well. Um, and that, in that way, we are then creating a system together of knowledge passing. And then hopefully, um, as humanity continues to grow, we all continue to pass knowledge down to each other. And again, if you look across history, oral traditions were kind of that way that primitive mind would um, translate knowledge through storytelling, through myths and um, that kind of stuff. So I think if we can, in our way, continue that tradition through the arts, especially, um, we will have effective communication for the future. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my own take on practice and then the systems that you were asking about. Mahani, over to you. Well, what you were asking from the how to remain connected somehow and how to remain aware and conscious. I think, well, now I'm back on the island living ever since we started um, the school that was maybe eight years ago, I moved back and just living here. Um, like it, it is not possible to not be aware. I mean, we don't have rivers uh, where we get water for drinking. We don't have lakes. We know here water is extremely precious. We each time that there's an overload of tourists, all the lights of the island uh, go out because we don't have um, and the production of the, the island's energy is not all renewable and it's based on diesel. And, and so each little thing has a really big impact here. And as I was telling you about the like the microplastic and all those things, it's a day to day thing that we live with. And it's, uh, it's part of our daily conversations with everybody. And I feel that, or at least I try to cultivate as much as I can the like, spiritual, like my spirit. I think that uh, that somehow makes uh, our inner light stronger and our strength too, maybe uh, makes us stronger because we could be so overwhelmed with everything that is happening and just go into desperation because it is a, it is so big what the climate crisis is so so big and changes are happening at such a small space that we could just give up but if we each really just realize how precious each one is to be able to do a change and even if it's small then it's really important and i think daily i try to work on that and of course i i also have my carbon footprint and try to just work but consciously that each little action is important and it, it has to do with um just with a way of living and of seeing things and of feeling things and if i start to get you know really kind of disconnected i just nature nature is always uh, i'm very fortunate i see the most amazing sunsets here the uh, la yesterday morning I saw three rainbows, three, <laughs> but in the most beautiful ways. And if we start once again to be able to to contemplate the beauty of the smallest things of a branch, of a, a, a flower, if we can spend time just really admiring all of this beauty, somehow we we reconnect with our essence too, mm -hmm. and we see all these patterns that are. Uh, have to do with everything that Marissa said and have to do also with our own inspiration to do things or like as you were asking with the music like to be able to express what we have inside 
I feel the music as one of the strongest, or the arts in general, as one of the strongest ways of uh, really bringing forth the best in people. And I do think that we have different fronts that have to be dealt with. One is the this major, uh, like the way the, the world is being led today, the way the big companies, big corporations are carrying things. And the other side is, and those things have to change, but how do we do this uh, really sustainable in time is cultivating uh, the children. In the children, strong values, values of, I mean, if you cultivate love in the smallest children, you, they will never be able to be people uh, that will you know earn billions of dollars and have people working for practically nothing because that is not i mean if they have strong values inside we will all want everybody to be able to afford their health and be able to you know live in the most uh, like to have decent uh, conditions of living so i think this the education has to be also refocused and that is a part of what we are also working on here. We also started a small, uh, another project, educational project we started in, in March. With, now we have eight children, four and five years old. And it's also just spiritually working with them and teaching them how to communicate. Children need to be valued. And, and especially now when education is so, the system of education is so obsolete. We need to now, once again, give confidence in the children, really let them see how special and how important and how beautiful and wonderful and unique they are. Instead of trying to put everybody into this little square of what we think should be the education, which has led us to what we are doing today. And that's normalized as, a, you know, you get an education to get a cardboard that allows you to have a good job and be paid and, you know, buy your things and then you die and that's it. So it all has to change and it has to do with caring. It has to do with just uh, working daily, little by little. So that that's my my inspiration is, is that. <laughs> Yeah, I was about to say that like when I started and I think my perspective and evolution has shifted considerably over the years, which is when I first started, it was like a cause within me was attaching to the causes around me. And so it was very course driven, which is to say that I was focusing more on the problem than the solution. And therefore you end up perpetuating more of the problem, whether you mean to or not. Um, and it's very easy to have to be broken within and then therefore from a space of pain or unrest or not having resolved your own self, connecting to the pain outside of you. And then the pain bodies just feed into each other and keep thriving, right? And, and, I, and it took me a conscious like look at my own being and where I was coming from and what is the way in which I'm aligning to the world around me and shifting out of that broken mindset, the broken heart space and coming into a place of like, what within me is thriving and how can I align that with, with things that are thriving in the world and therefore perpetrate more of the, that goodness, you know, that enlivened state of being um, and to truly celebrate what remains as opposed to keep focusing on what has been lost forever. And, and in that, you know, I realized I also like from you guys have been surfers, I've been a diver all my life. And I think it puts me in touch with my breath like nothing else, because you're, no, you're no, never as conscious of your next breath as you are when you're underwater. And every breath counts truly, <laughs> because it's like you could breathe your last if, you don't, if you're not mindful of your air. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that it took me um, as a metaphor was learning buoyancy, which is how do you stay afloat with just your lung capacity, which is to find a uh, a state of balance with your immediate environment. So how do you guys stay buoyant when you are confronted by dissent, denial, opposition, or even within your own self feel conflict, contradiction, and therefore are in a state of turmoil, unrest, or broken being? And how do you come out of that to a more positive resolution so that you can take on the things outside of you and communicate more of a positive, uplifting message as opposed to, even particularly since you all work with the youth, um, instead of focusing more on the problem sets and what isn't working? Um, we'll start with Matthew again. <laughs> I, put you on the I, I just was making notes about what you were saying because it's it's so important not focusing on what's been lost but what what remains um i mean you we, we can't help but look at what's been lost it, it exists it's in front of us um but it it can be self-defeating to to think that uh 
and and you mentioned a pain body. You know, I I I I got quite sick a few years ago, and I listened to Etol. I don't, I don't even know how to say his name. Etol Eckhart. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, Eckhart Tolle. It, it, okay, uh, thank you. Yes. It, yeah, um, and he talked, and it was it was such a such a revelation. The idea that we carry around this pain inside of our bodies, and once you realize that it's a choice that to to hold on to that pain it's the it's the lesson that we learn from buddha about holding on to anger that uh, it's like holding on to a burning a burning coal in your hand holding on to that anger it doesn't hurt the person that you're angry it doesn't solve the problem all it does is burn your burn your own hand and cause you misery and pain and so it, let it go you know Th that doesn't mean that you ignore it or pretend that it didn't exist but you you learn from from those mistakes, and as you move forward, you say this is what we have to do to prevent those mistakes. I mean, in this life uh, of, of 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 consciousness, uh, it's a it's a great uh, challenge to help others to to understand what we just discussed about pain bodies, about holding on to to misery, uh, but it's. Uh, and there was something else I think it was Marissa talking about um, that I don't know where it comes from, if it's Shakespeare or from the Bible, but they, they, where they say, as above, so below, as without, so within, you know, that, that, that we are of this earth, we are a part of this earth, we are an integral, integral part of it, but we are no more or no less, and I encourage if you've never read the book by Marcus Aurelius, he was one of the emperors of Rome, a book that he wrote called Meditations. Um, he says, why do, why do human beings uh, think that they're more significant than a leaf on a tree, that a, a leaf that has its spring, that has its summer, that has its autumn and falls to the ground and nourishes the tree for the next generation of leaves, that, that, that none of us are any more significant than, than that. And that what our uh, understanding that having the, the the kind of consciousness that human beings are are blessed with and cursed with sometimes, um, we we understand that we have a responsibility when you become conscious of 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 those kind of thinking of, of thoughts of Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle or Marcus Aurelius or or Carl Jung um, that that those those are, are great teachers and and Mahatma Gandhi and. And Jesus Christ, and you know, etc. There are great teachings from each of those people that we can take, uh, and 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 make this world a more peaceful, peaceful, loving, sustainable place. Um, but you know, what we always have to fight against is the ego and and greed. You know, that we all want a little bit more for ourselves and for our friends, and we we have to find some way of of, of finding a balance. You know that that the that the wealth of the planet is consolidated in a few hundred people. Um, when there's so much suffering in the world, is one of the most uh, un understandable, uh, unsustainable things that there is on the planet. That that why does somebody need uh, billions and billions of dollars? Why does somebody need to build a rocket ship to go up and touch the edge of 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 our atmosphere? For an Instagram moment, I mean, what 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 are we doing? You know, it, it, what if anything that when we saw the Earth from from the Moon and we saw how fragile and delicate we are in in the universe, um, it should have magnified the responsibility that each of us have to protecting our home. And and the 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 Earth's atmosphere is so thin that that, that it's this tiny layer that separates our our planet from space you know and the and what that atmosphere provides you know with the the, the filtering of ultraviolet violet, violet rays and that if we continue to produce uh, uh, gases that go up and compromise uh, our, our atmosphere uh, we're in big trouble you know if the earth continues to warm and the methane gas trapped in all of the all of the permafrost is released the air will be unbreathable if the oceans continue to warm that that cold layer of water that is sequestering a gazillion tons of methane on the bottom of the ocean will rise up and, and the Earth's atmosphere will be unbreathable. 
And, and the, the shame is not that, that we didn't do something to prevent it, that we didn't do something to stop it, but that we took out so many creatures that we share this planet with, the other animals that will be lost, innocently lost, that live in harmony with the planet that this creature, man, who lives it, it, so out of balance with, with the rhythms of the earth, um, destroyed the planet for so many creatures that, that, that were innocent. Uh, it, it's a real shame and it, and it magnifies the responsibility that each of us have to do something, to reduce our carbon footprint, to reduce our waste, and, and to be more loving and kind and forgiving and to walk gently on this planet. Absolutely. And uh, sorry, I jumped up and screamed <laughs> Eckhart's name because I love that book. And for the audience, if you haven't read The New Earth, I cannot recommend it enough. It was absolutely changing for me because I was going through um, the, the, there's a lot of audience members who are asking the same question is how do we deal with the despair, doom and gloom and loss of hope, the erosion of uh, empowerment being replaced by a state of helplessness and victimhood and i think reading that book genuinely shifted a lot for me and i'm sure it will for all of you as well so highly recommend that tome along with marcus aurelius book as well so highly you know if you guys like immerse yourself outside of the immediate egoic context of what we're perceiving and think about it from a consciousness aspect which is to say that even in destruction there are lessons to be learned and our consciousness is evolving through every expression of being so instead of judging it and reacting to it if you are understanding of it and you assimilate it then you're accounting for the whole because the whole exists with both the destruction and the creation aspect um, and the more time we spend in fighting that and, and believing in a binary system where it's a, a constant state of duality where you're in opposition like you know the good is happening the bad is happening why is the bad happening I try nowadays to truly unite my position and look at that whole and say, how can I show up to make the space more whole? Um, and for that, you need to unite within and be whole within and look at all the aspects within you that are fractured. So, you know, do every bit of self-work that you can because what you are within is what you bring about in the world around you. And so as everyone has said in this audience, I feel like they're all my kindred spirits here. Um, Marissa, over to you, because I'm sure you have an, a bit of wisdom to expand at this moment as well. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing to see how many of us are on the same page with what we're reading and what we're um, what we're doing inward to deal with the outward. And um, just to like piggyback off of everything you guys have already said, because I feel so inspired by it. And I think it's really well said what you guys have already said. But um, just to go back to nature and see that all of our questions that we have and all the language that we're putting to these emotions going on inside it's actually being dealt with already right in front of us and if you look at systems within nature like the fungal network um, there are already solutions here on earth for how do we break down our garbage how do we how do we unite how do we communicate um, again looking at the fungal network the things that are overlooked and almost yucky to us are actually the things that paradoxically are the things that make this earth beautiful so everything that breaks down is then built up and so if you look at yourself and what you're going through with this grief of destruction of the planet and all of the doom and gloom going on you can hopefully alchemize those feelings and turn them into inspiration for um, like an inner um, garden bed in which to grow new things um, and so that step one of acknowledging what's going on in the world and actually seeing and actually feeling that pain is so important for the very next step which is um, to then do something about it to get connected to your networks to get connected to the things that um, are the solution and so it is interesting to see this entire panel come together and feel the pain and see the pain and then now together we're already doing something about it and we're already looking to each other and hopefully mirroring what we see in nature and coming up with those solutions um, so i just wanted to say that as an encouragement because we all are on the same page here and um I think that it's all um, just part of the step of creating a better planet together. 
And Mahani, even what you were talking about earlier, you know, about how you can reach the state of unified connection, if you just took a moment to spend that instant with a living being, you know, and truly connecting to it, which I don't think we, we take that for granted so easily, right? I remember walking through Madison Square Park um, a couple of years back, and I was so deflated by the state of erosion in the world. And I'm, I've been crusading for every single thing I can think of because everything feels like it's my personal responsibility. So literally last night's dream was about me having a conversation with Bezos and the fact that he launched mindlessly and recklessly a Tesla into space. What is the purpose of that? Apart from it being a stupid gimmick resulting in space debris. So it's not enough. We're polluting the planet. We have to take that shit outside of us. Sorry for <laughs> French, but like, you know, the other aspect being why are we leaving this planet? Why are we so desperate to put so much money behind leaving a completely self-contained gorgeous biosphere that is filled with so, I mean, like, I totally get where you're coming from, Mahani, when you talk about taking that instant, because I, when I'm with any kind of landscape, and I, even when I walked through Madison Square Park and saw a single firefly light up, that's magic. You know, against all odds, life is so resilient, so keen on finding expression. All we need to do is give it the space to be. And here we are denying that space, that right to just space, you know? And so we'd love mm -hmm. to hear from you, building on your thought or being connected how do we create that space to foster living systems, to foster life and, and celebrate the joy of being, the magic of being? Okay, um, well, I wanted to go back yeah, a sure. second, just because of um, like what people are asking regarding like how to deal with the desperation. Just that part, I just wanted to just to say that um, at some point, like I got really, really depressed. I mean, I think I went into a depression probably for like a year and a half because of the, I mean, one of the biggest things was, you know, this world has no hope. I have no hope. What am I doing? And it took me like a year and a half probably to get out of it. And, but how do you turn this desperation into hope again? And it's with what you're just saying now, Asher. It's like, if you start, because we have, it's the two things of the world, the two sides of what's happening. It's everything that we've lost, everything that we are losing, and everything that is disappearing so quickly at a speed in which we cannot save. But on the other side, there is so much beauty still. There's so many amazing things. There's so many things that we still can do. There's so much to be saved still. There's so much to do. And that's the part where instead of mirroring, as you were saying, like the, this pain inside and seeing and reflecting it outside and getting the other people's pain and living it and all that, we, if we start working with our inside, if we start trying to, to be okay ourselves with who we are, with uh, working and being better people and being more conscientious in just uh, being able to admire everything, the smallest things around us in a way, it's something that we will give to others too, and it will help others and it will inspire others. And it will make others also think maybe I can also do something, even if it's small, even if it's, it might seem meaningless. And then they will inspire other people. And, and it becomes a, like, you know, this little pebble in the water, a teeny weeny pebble in the water that makes one little ripple, another, another, another. And it makes this big ripple that goes all the way to the other side of the lake i mean it's it comes from there like if we work on ourselves if we connect if we and especially if we have tools like arts like music eh, because nature is eh, nature for me is poetry nature is music nature is eh, that is art that is and if we connect with that part of ourselves it's connecting with our own inner nature i mean when a child is a, a little child do you think they're saying, oh, no, it's because I can't paint. I don't know how to paint. Oh, no, I can't sing. I have a horrible voice. No, they just do it because that's part of their nature, of our nature. And that's what we need to go back to. We need to go back to that, that uh, purity that is inside of us to be able to, to just trust in the best of us and also to trust other people to see not only the bad things in other people, but to be able to see the good things because everybody wants in a way, you know, we all want just to be happy. And uh, people are not happy if they're, you know, when they're doing uh, nasty things or if they have bad feelings inside. And if we are able to see in them, the beauty they have in there. And if we can connect with other people, 
it will, yes or yes, make a change, even if it's small, but it, it impacts. So yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> on that line. <laughs> We're like running close to the last minutes of the hour. And uh, there's one question, and I'm just going to flag that you might want to, I think it's Saeed Shoaib, Shoaib. I'm, if I'm mispronouncing your name, I'm really sorry about that. But I think you might want to tweet that question toward Marissa Quinn Art on Twitter or on Instagram. Um, because the question is about, you know, how do you as an artist uh, get more selective about the materials you're using? And what if it has negative impacts on the world? That's something I've struggled with a lot. It's not a mean to an end in a way where like you can just wash your responsibility off of the footprint of the of the tools and materials you use so i do think there's a, a sense of accountability there that needs to be looked at um but perhaps that's a question you could flag directly uh the, the thing i wanted to say was um in response to everything that has been uh acknowledged in this in the session you know i think the main thing that gets overlooked a lot and especially when, when it comes to the doom and gloom perspective um when you're living in places where you have more people who sound like we do right around us it's easy to take that for granted and i used to live like my primary residence was new york city and in the last year and a half i was like i wanted to challenge myself and try something different and, and realize how the rest of this, this country lives and move to montana and my neighbors are Trump supporters. Uh, they are completely <laughs> different individuals from how I'm oriented. And I realized that that put me in a place where I had to cultivate compassion and to have acceptance of the ignorance and not to judge them and condemn them, but to be open to the conversation. The, you know, am I going to put it against this person that they want to go and shoot every wolf out there? And they have, and they were narrating the most horrific stories of cruelty to me that they partake in on a daily basis because it's part of the culture. They've normalized that level of violence in the world around them. And for me, I realized, you know, if I were to shut him down now, he's just going to judge me and put me away and never be open to dialogue. But in being in, in an open conversation that's continuing, over time, he himself has turned around and he's like, oh, we're thinking of bursting fireworks for July 4th. Is that OK? We're only thinking of using sparklers. And so they check in with me because we've built mutual respect and trust and tolerance. So how what are the sort of final takeaways you can leave people with? Because mine would be truly finding acceptance for others to be inclusive because i think that's such a missing practice we all judge one another even saying that we're compassionate conservation oriented beings that we still judge those who don't show up for conservation right so my my real learning has been to show up in a way where you allow for those people to be as well and and have compassion for their difference in perspective so matthew what would your takeaway be for people oh man i wish you hadn't asked me that question because it's so hard it's so hard you know i mean um to have I, I i made a film called jesus was a commie it's not really about jesus or communism i'm not religious uh, at all um but I, I i do like the metaphors that that he spoke in he's but he said that you, you should when you have a banquet invite the poor you know invite the needy invite the blind and you know, the, the question I always ask myself is, would, would I, you, you know, would I have that grace to be able to invite to my banquet uh, the, un, you know, people that, that were unwashed or, you know, uh, homeless people? And it, it always magnifies the hypocrisy within myself that, 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 that in, the, in the necessity to do more, to be kinder, to be more forgiving. And it's hard. It's hard when you see somebody who uh, is causing, you know, like these giant uh, Dupont and and Monsanto. They're causing such danger, you know, such horrible things upon our planet. You know, producing this glyphosate. That's it's not just so much glyphosate that they spray on the ground, but the glyphosate has has is so plentiful now that it's in the atmosphere. When it rains, glyphosate is falling upon the earth. And glyphosate, I believe it's, it's classified as an antibiotic. And we know that antibiotics uh, kill good and bad inside of our bodies when we take them. And we know how we have to repopulate our bodies with, with probiotics you know, in our, in our gut, in our intestines, in our colons when we take those medicines. But if, if glyphosate is falling from the sky and on the earth, and could potentially compromise the incredibly complex uh, surface of our soil, you know, by killing the bacteria that, that's so beneficial to the digestion of, 
everything that falls on the soil. What are we doing to the planet? So it's very hard for me to be forgiving of companies that are uh, destroying our earth uh, for profit. Um, and I, I, I don't know that I can be so forgiving, but you know, it, it, you, I did a play, uh, I'm, you know, for those of you that don't know, I'm an actor um, of, of Harper Lee's book, To Kill a Mockingbird. And Harper Lee writes of her protagonist in the story, Atticus Finch, he says, we never truly understand another person until we get inside their skin and move around in it. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to get inside the minds and, and, the, and, the, and, and try to understand people who, who go big game hunting and shoot lions and shoot elephants. Um, do, like what, what is missing from their, from their lives to, to cause so much pain? And I, I think it's uh, um, uh, Mahani, what she said about teaching children love, um, that if we can, you know, that's, that's, that's the first step. I saw a video yesterday with an English fellow. He was born without cheekbones. And when his mother and father saw him, they rejected him. He was, they said they didn't want him, that it's not their son, that they're not going to be responsible. And they, they abandoned him in the hospital. And this boy without cheekbones was uh, adopted by a loving woman. And the video, I, I believe the man is probably in his 30s now. And he was talking about having grown up with this disfigurement on his face. And he talked about his mother and father and how he wanted to, to reach them, you know, when he was in his, in his 20s to go and find them. And they rejected, they did not want to see him. They did not want to know him. And he forgave them. He forgave them, he said, because what he had learned from his adoptive mother was forgiveness and, that, and love and self-love that he said, I love my face. I'm happy with who I am. And I forgive my mother and father, my, my birth mother and father, because they gave me life. They gave me the opportunity to exist, to have this incredible experience of being alive. And I, I'm, I, I, I want to carry that man in my heart for the rest of my life to remind me uh, to, to be grateful for being alive and to respect all life on our, our planet that we share this, this experience with. Thank you, Matthew. That's really poignant. Um, Marissa, uh, over to you. Yeah, um, and I, I think that um, as far as kind of like that takeaway that, you know, kind of drives me between these states of despair, but also inspiration. Um, a word that I always try to impart to students is curiosity, um, because the more curious you can get about something, the more that fear falls away and the more that doubt falls away. If you can get that childlike curiosity back inside yourself to, you know, research or get involved or, um, create and participate in the creative spirit and make something um, or use your voice or talents and in, in ways that um, you know do make a bigger difference I think that that's kind of the personal solution that I can offer to people is curiosity because if you do actually follow that um, you know things happen and personally just real quick my own example of that is um, I got really, really curious in grad school about beekeeping. And through that curiosity, I was able to find parallels between what's going on in the oceans and what's going on in the air and what's going on in the land. And it also gave me a language for um, society and working together as a community and um, seeing uh, the spirit of God as more than just a male in the sky, but as a feminine and masculine energy that's flowing through us. And so that curiosity of just bees got me to um, a place in my artwork and in my career and in my spirituality. 
um, to a place where I felt like I could start to dive into environmental issues as well. So again, curiosity, I think, is, is a really good way to have a takeaway from this too. Mm -hmm. Mahani, over to you. Oh, it's so many, so many thoughts cross my mind as I as I hear Matthew and Marissa. I I relate so well to both. <laughs> I mean, I think the it's hard not to, in my case at least, not to be uh, hindered by the frustration of like the big corporations and the. Uh, and not let this frustration stop the impulse of doing things um, because it can be so overwhelming and so devastating and so painful to see but I also think of what you said Matthew about that coal in your hand and I feel that in my case like it's that frustration that I, I realized that finally it, it just um, stops me from doing things so I've had to try to work on like just breathe and understand that I cannot change what Monsanto is doing, but I can do other things. I can do things which might not be uh, so big, but they can make a little bit of a better future, especially if we're thinking of the children and if we if we work with them if we work with uh, within ourselves uh, like in all our spiritual part to be as kind and as loving as we can we can bring other people towards us and we can help other people and i think nature uh, like all the environmental aspects are not um separated from what the people are like if we are able to help other people's healing processes we are healing in a way also our planet uh, because they will also be able to help in the aspects that they can so i just i just feel that we just need to also and open up and and just realize that, as I said in the beginning, our space of time, it is so, it's nothing, you know, it's just like a. I think she's frozen. Mahani, did we lose you? And disappeared. And, yeah. oh. Did you, am I back? Oh, I don't know. I've been talking for. No, no, no. We you... lost you for the last minute. It was a quick uh, blip. Okay, well. <coughs> I think. I was just, um, okay. just saying that we. We will also be how we think of nature and we think of it. hello here let me do something do you hear me better now yeah you hear me better okay sorry i'll just take the, the video off the what i feel is that if we work on ourselves we can be kinder and more loving human beings and by being that we can also help other people to heal their wounds and if we help other people heal their wounds we're also helping the nature environment because they can be more conscientious too. When people are in pain uh, or um, enveloped in their own problems, it is very hard for them to see outside of themselves. So if we are able to integrate the people to, to make us every, everybody feel like we are really one big family, we have one home to take care of and we need to care for each other as a family. And if we can achieve that, then I think we will we will be on a on a good path. I think we have some hope. 
I, I, you know, I, the, the message that resonates from this is, um, you know, the healing that comes from self-acceptance. And, and I think Matthew's story speaks to that as well, about that boy who was able to forgive his parents for abandoning him and judging him based on something so superficial. But really, you know, and that's where I'm, I, I try to develop compassion because I believe me, I've been in the space of utter resentment towards so much, you know, that was not doing right by the world and comes from such a space of righteous anger, right? You're like, how dare they do that? Um, and so going through that journey and coming to the other side of it, I think what I've realized is that the, the parents, you know, who abandoned that boy, it's because they're not able to accept the parts of them that's not perfect in their eyes. So it comes from a state of self-rejection, which is a state of self-violence and conflict within. And you're not in a state of happiness and joy when you're there. So obviously everything you can inflict on another or on the world at large is also going to be equally miserable. So I think, you know, every day I'm like, am I choosing to be miserable because I am utterly empowered and I have the agency over my own self to do one better by me and therefore better by the world. And so I think, you know, every day it's, it's a constant dialogue of how can I heal what within me is rejecting something outside of me? And, and can I come to a state of harmony within that relationship? Because really it's just all about you. I mean, none of this even exists if you don't wake up tomorrow morning and open your eyes. So your consciousness gives acknowledgement to all consciousness. And that's where you come into unity and into a state of expression and being, right? So I think, we, we often forget that us coming into a state of being daily is what acknowledges the state of being itself. It's sort of a, a, a cyclical sort of Ouroboros. Um, and so I'm, I'm so grateful that, you know, that I got to be in the state of being with the three of you in this immense conversation, which was so much deeper than I planned on getting into today because I wasn't sure how this was going to flow, uh, but deeply grateful for each of you. And uh, I have already given you a follow. I'm going to stalk you all for the coming days and weeks and months because I would love to see how each of us can, you know, uh, be in conversation and continue this sort of of meaningful dialogue and empowerment of ourselves but also the world around us um, by staying in connection so thank you so much for showing up and i don't know if todd wants to step in to round up the panel session but thank you each for being here yeah likewise really a, really a fascinating uh conversation I, literally through the course of the conversation i had four messages come in from whatsapp from various colleagues around the world about how inspired they how inspiring the conversation was for them so um, and, and really, we had, gosh, I mean, just looking at where folks were coming from, from the Philippines, Bonaire, Bhutan, Vietnam, Nepal, Ethiopia, the US, Canada, UK, just multiple countries. Um, I want to thank all the panelists. Asher, fantastic job of moderating. Matthew, thank you. Marissa, thank you for such an inconvenient hour coming and showing up. Um, Mahani, if you could, I just want to make sure we thank, I think you're at one of the hotels on the island because I know if anyone's ever been on Easter Island, it is at a premium to find one of the two or three good Wi-Fi connections. So where are you at real quick? Yes, I would like to thank Hotel Hangaroa for their generosity lending this space to be able to do this connection. It's uh, very difficult to connect here on the island. <laughs> so well, yeah, hey, it's about, very as, you, as, as the message is, it's about all coming together and helping each other. So that's uh, we thank them uh, for setting that up with you. And, and again, thank you for joining for joining us as well. We want to thank all the attendees. Again, a very diverse group of folks logging on from all over the world. Uh, we're going to name the winners of either the book or Marissa's artwork. If you're interested in Marissa's print, just go to plasticoceans.org. You're going to find the um, links off to our Trees and Seas Festival. It's a beautiful piece of artwork. All her artwork is amazing. Go and check her out. Um, we do have to thank sponsors because all of this is not possible to offer at absolutely no cost without our sponsors. Uh, Montez Wines, Avocado Green Mattress, EcoWatch is a great um, source of news if you want to follow what's going on in the environmental space. And One Tree Planted, who really came to bat for us and providing over 20,000 of the 100,000 trees we're planting around the world. Um, with that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, let's go ahead and get our winners up here. We have Bhupal Nepali, Iram Sadiq, Mark Granlin, Sylvia Campos, and Dikle Agisarajis. I apologize for any mispronunciations. There you actually see some of Marissa's beautiful artwork. Again, this is specific um, to our Trees and Seas Festival, really de depicting the circularity of nature through Chiloé Island, which is kind of our symbolic hub of the festival this year. So um, again, you're going to have a choice of the book or the artwork. We will get in touch with you and ask you that question and we'll get those shipped out to you. So congratulations to everybody. 
Um, again, I thank everybody for joining us. This is part of our Trees and Seas Festival at Plastic Oceans International, where we've been celebrating and uniting the concepts of ocean and forest conservation in over 30 locations worldwide, um, including some great activities from partners like Toki Rapa Nui. Check out Toki Rapa Nui, by the way. I, uh, always an organization that does such amazing work and is always in need of support. So donate, donate, so Mahani and their team can, can really continue their awesome uh, um, work in, in music education and cultural heritage on, on Rapa Nui. So um, with that, thank you everybody for joining and uh, have a safe and healthy weekend.